Good, then let's um, continue. So we're talking about the expected number of local maxima, mu. And again, always keep in the back of your head um, the expected number of local maxima, mu, at a given threshold level and under the null hypothesis and for a specific uh, random field. Yeah, so for example, a Gaussian random field or a T field. We will, I, I think I haven't defined uh, T fields and F fields yet, so we will uh, also do that uh, in due course. Um, and uh, before the break, um, I introduced that the expected number of um, local maxima for a given random field under the null hypothesis at a given threshold level U. Um, is approximated um, in random field uh, theory based p value correction by the expected Euler characteristic of the excursion set. Yeah? So um, that's the last thing that we saw expected Euler characteristic um, Euler characteristic of the excursion set. And um, now, mathematically or historically, the reason for um, this approximation um, is um, that it's actually not that simple to um, evaluate um, the expected number of um, local maxima in general for random fields. So one can do that for um, um, stochastic processes, and I think for uh, for what yeah, I think for simple stochastic processes, but I, I don't dare to say for which one, one can actually um, compute the number of expected uh, um, local maxima or threshold uh, crossings um, um, uh, um, no, um, precisely. But if one wants to do uh, make more general statements for um, um, not stochastic processes, but random fields, and um, um, not only a specific type of um, a, a random process, then actually the only th the thing that is available is this expected order characteristic business. And this is um, kind of the work yeah, that goes back to uh, work by this Russian mathematician in the late 60s, Moscow, and then uh, Hasshofer and his PhD student um, uh, Robert Adler in the um, 70s, so this is fairly old um, stuff. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's actually, if you think about mathematics as being really, really old, um, it's actually fairly new stuff. Um, and um, has then, um, especially this expected Euler characteristic business, has been introduced to the brain imaging uh, literature by Worsley in the early 90s. When Guns N' Roses were at the prime. Um, but that's before your time. Um, so, expected Euler characteristic. The question is what is the Euler characteristic? And um, the um, uh, Euler characteristic is what is known as a topological invariant, which also will not tell you much but it gives some direction, topological invariant. So the Euler characteristic is, you can either view it as a number or a function that you can allocate to geometric objects in uh, one, two, especially two and three dimensions. So assume you have a geometric object, oh no, let's take this, um, you have a um, geometric object like this, uh, a cup. So let's assume you have a cup that looks something like this. So that's a cup. Um, then um, the um, Euler characteristic um, assigns a number to um, this cup that uh, depends on the geometric makeup of um, this uh, um, cup. And it's called a topological invariant. Um, because it measures um, the geometric features of um, um, geometric objects irrespective of the way that they are bent. So if you think this is would be made of rubber or something and you could squeeze it or, or tear it or whatever um, without changing the fact that it's kind of this cup shaped uh, thing, so maybe just extend thing, but it still has kind of the overall cup uh, layout, and um, it would still have the um, uh, same number. So, um, yeah, 
And that's what the Euler characteristic does. Formally, to introduce the Euler characteristic, that's actually um, um, beyond the scope of our course and actually also beyond um, the stuff that is um, done typically in the brain imaging uh, literature. Um, the reason uh, twofold for that first, it's uh, there are actually three reasons why we don't formally uh, discuss the Euler characteristic. First um, is um, that it's actually not that uh, easy to do. So Adler in his review 2000 writes, uh, the Euler characteristic is one of those unfortunate cases in which what is easy for the human visual system to do quickly and effectively requires a lot more care when mathematicized. And um, so the, it requires a lot of uh, things to, to do that um, mathematically. The main reason is that if you think, for example, if, that you have a, a 2D shape, something like this, um, and you are supposed to um, now um, characterize that um, geometrically, you have to think about um, how to capture um, the outline essentially and, and let's say this hole here of this and then you need functions and you need to think about when do uh, so functions that describe the outline and how um, when and then you have to infer things like okay if I uh, bend left and then bend right Again, so how, what does that say about um, the uh, shape and so on? So it's, um, it needs a lot of um, uh, calculus to um, define um, the Euler characters formally, and we don't want to do that. The second uh, uh, reason is um, that um, it's actually also what Adler says, it's actually quite easy to get an intuitive grasp of it in a kind of semi-formal uh, way that we will see in a, a second. And finally is that um, in the whole of random field theory based um, p-value correction, all the characteristics are never actually computed, but um, there are closed form solutions for this expected value of the Euler characteristic, and um, this is what we will uh, um, talk about. So there are many reasons not to go too deep into the Euler characteristic um, business in all uh, generality. Um, but um, yeah, to get a grasp of uh, what it uh, is, um, um, yeah, let's look at um, what um, is usually kind of the semi-formal uh, definition of um, the Euler characteristic of an excursion set. Um, it is, like I said, it's a number that is uh, allocated to um, geometric objects in two or three or four dimensions. Um, it's the number of connected components minus the number of handles um, and handles in the sense that you can put your finger through it, um, although that might depend on the size of your finger and um, the handle. Um, but in the sense of uh, holes, in, in, I mean, you know where a handle of a cup is, um, and so you know what a hole in this sense means. Here, if you have a 2D thing uh, where there's also a hole, this is also a handle. Yeah? Um, but in a way, you could also discuss for the cup that this thing is also a hole, but that's not a hole. The hole is a handle. Yeah? Uh, plus the number of voids. Um, of course, uh, of a, you, the whole thing. Yeah? So uh, for a given excursion set, um, you should essentially count uh, the number of connected components, subtract from it the number of handles um, or holes in the excursion set, and add to it the number of um, voids. Um, and I think quite uh, um, intuitive and quite elucidating are these um, examples that uh, are provided by Worsley in, in this 1996 uh, review. I think that's the one in chance, which is also quite nice if you want to learn a little bit more and in very colloquial style uh, about um, the Euler characteristic. 
Um, if you have, um, we might want to think about excursion sets now in terms of fMRI, in this case uh, on a um, two-dimensional uh, plane, so you might want to think about the uh, about activations in the brain or whatever at a given threshold. Um, if you have a single um, a solid excursion set like I just drawn here, so um, let's do this. Um, um, for a single solid set, um, then because um, the all evaluates to one because you have the number of connected components so there's this is with this one connected components you have no handles or no holes in this excursion set and there are no voids uh, in this excursion set with voids i will see in a second a little bit more so uh, the all characteristic of um, this uh, excursion set um, would um, be um, one yeah. Um, then, uh, if you think about an excursion set now in 3D um, that has, let's see how far my drawing skills go there, um, that has the shape of a donut, like a donut from Simpsons, a real donut, not a mathematical thing. That's not a, the nicest donut you have ever seen, but I think you get the idea. So donuts are these things that are kind of like rings. You can also think about uh, things that if you're on the Titanic, you need these safe rings. How are they called? How are these things called that you throw into the ocean and say, here, take care of yourself. I throw you a donut-shaped thing. A lifesaver, yeah. Um, such a thing, a donut or a life-saving ring lifesaver, has a color characteristic of zero because there's one connected component, which is this thing here, um, and there is one handle. So you have uh, one minus one, which is zero. There is no void. Ah, that's, that's why we might not want to talk about these lifesavers, but we want to talk about donuts. On first approximation, because the li these lifesavers they may be like tires and um, may have actually voids. Um, so if they if they are air filled, then actually the oil characteristic is uh, not zero. Um, a donut, um, which we assume is filled, although of course there is some air between the dough uh, parts, uh, is supposed to be filled. Um, so if you have a, you could also think of a tire that is uh, solid, um, that would have um, or a characteristic of a zero. Um, if you have a pretzel ch shaped thing, which looks, can I draw a pretzel? Like this. Again in 3D. Um, that would have an Euler characteristic of minus two because there's one connected component, which is kind of the dough of the pretzel, and then there are three handles. So you can put your finger through there, through there, and through there if you want. And <laughs> um, this would uh, make uh, one connected component minus uh, three handles, so that's uh, um, um, an Euler characteristic of uh, minus two. And now the thing with the void, um, a tennis ball. So I'm not sure how to draw a tennis ball, but you can think of a tennis ball, and don't they have these kind of, that's not too bad for a tennis ball, um, or any kind of uh, air-filled, uh, Ball like a balloon, uh, maybe would that be okay? Yeah, I guess. Although balloon is a little bit surface-like, but um, yeah, a tennis ball um, where you have one connected component which makes up kind of the hull of this uh, tennis ball. Um, it doesn't have handles um, and uh, it has a void. Yeah, so um, 
that would be then an Euler characteristic of two. Um, so you can think of more examples, um, but one has to keep this void business in mind. Um, I mean, we can look at it if we have um, um, if we actually uh, have um, the typical thing in fMRI would be actually that you have uh, multiple clusters. Um, that would be um, two um, connected components, so that would be an order characteristic of two. But we've also seen this uh, that if we um, increase the threshold, so depending on the threshold level, you might first start with um, actually a single connected component um, with one handle, so you have an Euler characteristic of uh, zero, and then these, um, um, uh, as, as you increase the threshold, you get uh, to a different um, Euler char characteristic. So, um, so this is then what I also write, uh, from, or basically copied from the um, review by Worsley. Uh, all the characteristics, they not only exist in fMRI, they also uh, exist in um, cosmology, on astrophysics. Um, so you might have seen, you always see these images of, they look something like this, and then they say this is the uh, radioactive background activity, radioactive Hintergrundstrahlung, where the whole thing looks essentially like this. And this is then the latest image of Hubble, something like this, and you have this uh, over space varying um, degrees of um, um, radiation. And so they also use these kind of topological features to make sense of the structure of the universe. And um, there they have, which is also interesting, um, these notions of uh, a meatball. Uh, um, topology. So that would refer um, many disconnected components, each with very few holes. Um, meatball topology. Um, there, the Euler characteristic is uh, positive. If um, you have what is called a sponge topology, so there you have many holes, or let's say handles. Um, um, so you have clusters um, that are connected by many bridges, meaning that you have many holes, a sponge. Um, then your Euler, or not your Euler, but the Euler characteristic is. Uh, um, smaller than zero because you get um, this kind of minus uh, number of handles. And if you um, have a bubble topology, um, where you have many uh, surfaces that enclose hollows, um, then the Euler characteristic is again positive. Yeah. So I think these kind of things um, give you an intuitive feel. So it really comes down to this um, uh, general formula. But now, of course, to mathematize this and to actually have something in 2D and then uh, be able to compute. So you can think of also programming and uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, writing a program that can compute the Euler characteristic of uh, something is not that easy, right? So because you're not just testing whether something is larger than uh, um, a given value, so whether something is an excursion set, but um, how many holes, for example, there are in writing such computer code um, that's actually um, um, reliable is actually more demanding, and hence the mathematization of this uh, is also more demanding. Um, now, I already said that um, we don't have to actually uh, compute Euler characteristics uh, per se, because the only thing that we are interested in is the expected Euler, character, uh, the expected Euler characteristic. And um, 
we are even more interested in only a relatively specific case, um, namely the case that uh, we are in a um, high threshold setting. So we have now again in 1D, we have somehow this. Somehow this. And um, then as we discussed also previously, as we increase the threshold, um, the um, excursion set actually just contains one connected component, meaning that uh, the Euler characteristic is one. Yeah? So one connected component, Euler characteristic one, there are no voids and no holes in this excursion set. Um, if you increase the threshold even more, um, the number of um, um, connected components is of course zero, um, so the Euler characteristic is zero, right? So we have two um, cases, um, one that um, the Euler characteristic is uh, one, if um, the excursion set is not empty in this uh, um, in the limit of high thresholds, right? So if we go uh, to lower thresholds, then of course um, the Euler characteristic takes on different values. But if we're at very high uh, threshold values, um, we have the case that the Euler characteristic is one, or um, the Euler characteristic is zero. if um, the excursion set is actually the empty set. Yeah? So uh, Euler characteristic one, excursion set not empty, Euler characteristic zero, uh, excursion set empty. Um, yeah. Um, now, Now, the um, thing is that, um, of course, the excursion set in this level of high thresholds, this um, um, contains also um, um, a local maximum, um, which motivates um, to actually approximate um, in the level of um, um, high, uh, sorry, in the limit of high thresholds to approximate um, the um, number of local maxima the same way that actually the, um, the probability for the global maximum is approximated, which we will see later. Um, essentially, it comes down to the fact that the um, uh, expected Euler characteristic is can be evaluated um, by a formula which is originally derived from the uh, global maxima but in the limit of high thresholds also applies to the local maxima because you then only have one local maximum which is the same as the global maximum um, is approximated by a formula sorry the expected Euler characteristic is uh, the expectation of the Euler characteristic is given by a formula, and this is an approximation for the expected number of local maxima. Um, and the formula takes the following form. Which is kind of the most important formula of um, the whole thing, um, which will also feature at various places. So we not see this uh, formula only today. This um, formula gives a value for um, the expected Euler characteristic in the uh, um, limit of high thresholds. And um, yeah, it looks like follows. So um, for three, um, no, this actually goes to many Ds. But uh, we are mainly interested in the 3D case, so maybe I should. Oops, cannot erase this anymore. Should be a th um, maybe even easier with the 3D case. Okay. So, 
Um, yeah, so this is, this is um, the formula that is used in random field theory based p value correction uh, as um, the value for the expected Euler characteristic, which in, in turn is uh, used for uh, approximating the expected number of local maxima. Um, and maybe I should the link. I think I have to make this link more explicit. This is not quite clear yet. Um, but first, let's talk about the formula. Um, the formula comprises uh, two things. One are the Riesel volumes. And this is why we needed to talk about intrinsic and Riesel volumes. Um, of order D. And um, what is called the Riesel densities, which are not probability densities, but Riesel densities. This uh, formula is nice in the sense that um, you have there are contributions um, that account for volume and smoothness. And there is a component that accounts for um, the threshold and the type of field. So these Riesel densities, they have been analytically um, determined and we will uh, look at them. Um, for different um, fields, but they can be used uh, in this approximation for the Euler characteristic, uh, not approximation, I always say it wrong, in this evaluation of the expected Euler characteristic um, for any kind of um, um, specific uh, um, really, no, not realization, for a specific kind of situation. Um, where you look at a specific volume and then a given smoothness. Um, practically, this means that um, when you um, do an fMRI analysis, what has to be estimated based on the observed data are um, the Riesel volumes, so essentially the smoothness of your um, um, statistic parametric map. And then um, the, this can be combined um, with um, the knowledge of um, the threshold and the type of field um, that give rise to the uh, Riesel densities to compute the expected Euler characteristic. And this expected Euler characteristic then is used as the approximation for the um, expected value of the number of local maxima. It's actually not only used for that, but this is one of its uses. So let's try to get this again a little bit clear in terms of the expectation of the um, um, Euler characteristic and the local maxima. So the, um, the expected number of the uh, uh, of local maxima. If you are in the case um, of a very th high threshold, um, corresponds to the same thing as the Euler characteristic. So that's the important point. Um, so you can have, so let's say it again, so you can have two situations with regards to local maxima in the, le in the limit of high um, thresholds. Either um, the excursion set has no local maxima because it's empty. So then mu equals zero because there is no local maximum in the excursion set because the whole excursion set is empty. Or you have one local maximum in um, the excursion set, which by coincidence is also the is also the global maximum of the whole random field because it's in your uh, excursion set at this high level of threshold, but it's also a local maximum. Yeah, 
And then um, the expected number of um, uh, um, local um, maxima in this case, um, of course, corresponds to um, the um, probability. So if we now compute, uh, maybe sh should do that. Um, if we compute the expected uh, value of the number of local maxima in this limit of very high thresholds, then we are only interested in two cases. Um, one case, um, the expected, uh, uh, sorry, one case, the number of local maxima is zero, and to compute the pro, um, pro, um, Jesus, to uh, compute the expected value, we need to multiply the probability that um, the um, number of local maxima um, is um, zero times uh, the value that it takes on, um, zero, plus the probability that uh, the number of local maxima is one times uh, the number it takes on. Yeah? So this is a typical expected value. Um, so like you compute the expected value of a die, so you take one six for one plus one six for two and so on. And in this case, there are only two cases that we're interested in that the random variable takes on, namely zero. The, uh, um, there is no local maximum because uh, the excursion set is empty or there is one uh, local maximum because uh, it's the global maximum of the whole thing. We have to multiply with the probabilities and um, this, these cases that um, the, um, the, um, the number of local maxima is zero corresponds also to the case that the excursion set is actually empty. This uh, uh, corresponds to the case that the excursion set is non-empty, which uh, also corresponds to the case that the Euler characteristic is um, uh, zero versus that the Euler characteristic is one. And um, then the question is, and the whole thing, um, what this whole thing comes down to is, um, what is this probability? Yeah? Because this doesn't uh, contribute anything because here the value is zero. Um, this value we know. So the question is, what is the probability that there is one local maximum in the limit of high thresholds, which is, by coincidence, also the uh, probability um, that, uh, uh, that um, you have um, the probability of the global maximum. And this, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself here, the probability for the um, global maximum, this has always been uh, appro uh, approximated by the expected Euler characteristic, so by this. And because this is the case, also the number of local uh, of local maxima is approximated by the um, um, expected Euler characteristic. Yeah. So this is um, a little bit of a weird logic, but it's all um, this logic makes sense in the limit of very high thresholds. Yeah. Where you only have these things that you either have um, um, a local maximum, which is also the global maximum, um, and the excursion set is non-empty, or you don't have that. Um, and we will come back to that, but there's a question which might happen. Um, yeah, so how would they determine when it is appropriate to use this technique? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so I think I wrote a little bit uh, about this. As for the accuracy of this approximation, it has been demonstrated that it becomes exact in the limit of very high values of the threshold U, uh, in which... Um, yeah, the only, like I said, the only characteristic value is either one, one remaining cluster, or zero. And this has actually been, the, the exactness of this approximation has been demonstrated um, for a specific random field um, by Taylor et al. in 2005, um, where you might notice that um, this is way after um, this has been uh, put into uh, the brain imaging um, um, work. Um, they have, uh, what they have done, um, for example, also if you look in, in uh, Carl's paper from 1994, where they, um, uh, where they um, um, did this and some other things, they have done simulations, of course. Mm -hmm. So they have done exactly what we did uh, for, for these densities that we did with the Garbo bandit. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can simulate this and then check whether your approximation is roughly 
correct if you are doing this in a um, in a high um, threshold environment. The the whole story is, but this you will uh, also find in the books by uh, and Taylor. The thing is, this is an approximation, and especially this uh, Ws um, for the number of local maxima uh, and the um, uh, uh, global maximum, which is ah, okay, yeah, it holds in the limit of very high thresholds, but beyond that um, is an issue. They uh, know that, but it's kind of the best that you can do in an analytical uh, manner to come up with a um, with a um, um, expression that will give you um, the probabilities for recursion set features under the null hypothesis. So they really pushed. I mean, this is as much as uh, um, yeah, there is mathematical work to describe uh, random fields. So of course you can define them, but then the question is what are their characteristics? And they pushed and um, come with that, do simulations that it's, it's roughly okay in high uh, in, in limits and have done the analytical proof that it's exact for one uh, process, I think Gaussian process with some Gaussian, I assume, uh, covariance uh, function in this Taylor paper. Um, and then it's also very good. So the approximation is uh, fairly good. I didn't include a, um, a quantitative um, um, quantitative result here or so, but it's it's fairly uh, t uh, tight in situations where you can do some analytical uh, work. So uh, the question is, of course, is it exact? Then it's actually the same as something else, or is it very close to something that you can still analytically do? And then you can look at inequalities, and it's still very good. So they did stuff in this regard, but it remains an approximation. Mm -hmm. uh, what doesn't remain an approximation is actually this bit, um, although um, the um, um, the laser volumes um, they are then um, estimated, and hence also in a specific uh, experimental context um, approximated. So yes, but before you know, and uh, I will, we have to talk a little bit more, but before you from this infer that, ah, this is approximation, then I want to do simulations, uh, the whole thing, then I want to do, uh, use alpha sim and do these uh, um, and permutation tests and so on. Before you go down that uh, route, let me just warn you that in the end, uh, you can only do these simulations uh, properly if you also um, put in some modeling assumptions, for example, about the smoothness and about um, uh, yeah, and basically the relation between different uh, sets. And then to do this uh, permutations um, in this uh, SPM, uh, SPM cluster business uh, simulation thing, as accurate as possible, you have to basically buy into this whole framework. But feel free to wander off for a year until you see what I meant. Anyway, um, so yeah, this is kind of it's, it's, it's kind of a downer in the sense that uh, one thinks, okay, uh, it's an analytical framework, but it uses approximations. But then it's uh, the best um, that can be done. Okay, we will come. Uh, we will always come back to this expected Euler characteristic. So um, for the moment, let's again. Uh, um, Fix, fix, fixate, or whatever, that we use the uh, expected Euler characteristic here as an ex, um, approximation for the expected number of local maxima in the excursion set, um, knowing that this only holds true in the um, um, limit of high thresholds. But let's now talk for the rest of the session um, a little bit more about the components about this um, formula. So, um, or were there other questions actually? No. Um, so, the Rese volumes we've discussed at length last time, and um, yeah, you know what they are. What we haven't seen yet are these uh, Rese densities. Um, the Rese densities, um, they need to be analytically um, um, derived. And maybe this is nice if actually I put up the picture. Um, and actually a big breakthrough in this uh, domain of random field theory based p-value correction and the whole business of uh, describing excursion sets uh, came in 2007 by, in the work by Jonathan Taylor who showed that it's quite easy to compute these residentities if you know how to. 
like always. Um, but uh, uh, Worsley had has done quite some work in the um, 90s to um, analytically derive them um, without this knowledge. And they now exist in closed forms. And let me show you that. Something is funky, but it's fine. So these visual densities, they of course also, oh uh, they of course also. Um, implement an SPM, so you find this SPM function, I don't remember its name right now, um, where you can um, evaluate these um, visual densities. And, shit, this is the old version. Sorry. Uh, ah, fuck. Uh, well, then you have to look. Um, then you cannot uh, show that here because I didn't uh, synchronize. So look into figure 6.1 in your handout. Um, there you see plotted for different types of fields, um, the Z field being what you know best about, um, namely that's uh, a Gaussian random field um, with um, variance function um, identical to 1 and expectation functions identical to 0. That's also called a Z field. Um, there you see these densities, and um, we are interested in three dimensions. So we have this rho zero, rho one, rho two, rho three, which go into this formula um, six point nine to, uh, together with the um, uh, resil volumes. And you see um, that the, these densities um, essentially um, assume smaller and smaller values the larger um, the value of u gets. Yeah. Which means, um, if you think about that, you uh, that you have um, constant reason volumes. That means if you um, multiply your constant reason values um, with these densities for a higher and higher threshold, the um, expected Euler characteristic and hence the expected number of local maxima gets smaller. Yeah, that's the most important thing actually. So. Um, the, the parametrics are interesting, um, so in the sense that they have very specific uh, yeah, kind of uh, follow a, uh, sp fairly specific uh, forms, but the bottom line is uh, the larger the threshold, the smaller the uh, density, and uh, hence the smaller the expected Euler characteristic. You can also, of course, um, you should interpret these densities um, as the expected number, the expected Euler characteristic or the expected number of local maxima for um, um, a random field that extends over a unit space and uh, is of unit smoothness, right? So like you ex uh, um, um, understand a density in, in physics or in, in probability density, it's always uh, normalized to um, to a unit, uh, um, to a given unit. So, for example, uh, the standard uh, density in physics is mass divided by volume. If you have volume one, then it's just the mass. So it's the mass uh, um, per unit volume. And here, this um, these densities are the expected number of local maxima slash the ex slash the expected number of uh, the expected Euler characteristic um, for a unit. Uh, volume and uh, a unit smoothness. They take somewhat different forms for different fields. What a T field is and an F field, uh, you might be able to infer even without me having provided the formal definition. So a T field is of course um, a random field that where the random variables uh, represent T values, which then depend on the uh, degrees of freedom, same for the F field. What I plotted there um, are, of course, uh, functions. So if you go into um, uh, on the next page on table 6.1, you see with some, no, that's not a type of uh, feature. You see um, the um, parametric forms of um, the Z field and the T field uh, densities. Couldn't be bothered to copy the F field densities because they 
uh, that's uh, it's more light tech uh, madness. Um, you see that these are in closed form in the sense that uh, if you look at the Z field on the right hand side, you see um, an expression that is a function of u. Yeah. So for one, two, and three, you see that these closed form expressions uh, for u. Um, in, in U. Um, for zero, what you actually see is um, with a, a little bit of imagination, you see that this is a standard normal distribution um, integrated from U to infinity. Yeah? So, um, which is just um, one minus the cumulative density of a um, standard normal distribution. Um, interesting to see and also being exploited for example for uh, computing the expected volume yeah so these formulas there one can derive um, mathematically and you find this work by Worsley in the mid 90s uh, basically between 1992 when he did this for um, yeah we did it without um, these correction terms for the intrinsic volumes from zero to second order um, to 1996. So in between, he, um, among other things, derived these densities. And then Jonathan Taylor found what is called the Gaussian kinematic formula, um, which gives you a simple way to compute uh, these uh, densities for whatever you like. Yeah. Good, and now the important thing is if you have approximated uh, the Riesel volumes and have uh, these formulas ready and have a given threshold, then you can compute a value for the expected oil characteristic and you can use the uh, value for the expected oil characteristic where you're actually only interested in the expectation when the oil characteristic is one or zero um, to approximate the number of local maxima of course, only in the case when the local number of local maxima is either one or zero. Yeah. Good. So um, then I want to stop here and um, then next time I'll continue with the expected number of clusters and um, expected cluster volume and then go to the distribution functions. Any questions right now? No? Good. Then uh, let's meet in the other room fairly soon. Thank <laughs> you.